Okay, and we're live. Uh, thank you, everybody, for waiting. I do apologize for the uh, massive delays. Uh, it turns out that when you move and you set your, you set your equipment up just like it was before, uh, things things go awry. Um, with me today is, uh, is is Rob Rob Patchett, I believe, is your your last name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all me. the way <laughs> from uh, the the Coxwalls Distillery. Pardon me. And I'm, I'm really nervous. This is just, uh, you know, I've been sweating like crazy since um, about uh, 20 minutes beforehand. So nearly an hour of sweating. This shirt's going to be a mess. I might have to throw it out. Anyway, I really thank you for, for joining right now. And uh, we've got a few people that have joined in, which is fantastic. Again, I do apologize for the massive delays. But uh, without further ado, um, Rob, why don't you give us just a little bit of, uh, of a self-introduction and tell us about your whiskey travels and how that landed you at Cotswolds Distillery. Sure, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, may I advise you get yourself a little dram just to calm down, everything's gonna be okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is Rob. I'm from the Cotswolds Distillery. Uh, I've been with the company for over four years now. So one of the few that actually predate the release of our first whiskey and uh, I've been in the drinks industry since I was 16 years old. Uh, I won't reveal how old I am now, but needless to say, it's well over 20 years. Um, worked in every aspect of the drinks industry, uh, all over England and Europe. Um, nightclubs, bars, restaurants, hotels. Um, worked as a sommelier, mixologist, manager, keeper of people, uh, pharmacist, whatever you want to call it, um, found myself in wine, um, managing a large selection within a company about five years ago, and uh, was selling a lot of Cotswolds Distillery spirits, and due to the ever-rising popularity of the brand itself, when it came time, Cotswolds Distillery approached me about actually working with them full-time as we were having so much success, and I jumped at the chance. I saw the potential of how big the gin boom was globally, especially in the UK, and also how much potential there was for growth within the fact that we also had a single malt whiskey coming online soon. So uh, in 2017, I joined the distillery, and I would love to give you a title as to what I do, but I seem to just be the dog's body, really. If you want me to do tastings or menus or sales or distribution, or tours or samplings or anything of that nature i am there for the distillery to get the job done and i guess this evening i'm here to talk you through our wonderful portfolio with mark which uh <clears throat> which i'm just so super super excited about and i'm still a little bit nervous so i'm going to have a quick uh sort of a warm-up dram of your wonderful 46 percent coxwolds single malt this is the 2014 Fantastic. edition so uh, this is just just to uh, to get myself going, and then I think we'll we'll get into the gins first, if that sounds good to you, and then we'll get back in through the whiskey. So uh, cheers, everybody, and hopefully uh, you've, you've hung out long enough waiting for us. And I do apologize, but uh, cheers, cheers, Rob. I should, cheers to you. I should join in. I'm going to pour myself a little gin just to wet the palate, get everything ready. So in case you're wondering about the aspect, this is not my regular camera. Um, for whatever reason, my computer couldn't, couldn't find my um, ultra high definition Logitech Brio. Uh, it's not gonna go in the bin yet. I'll try to figure out how to um, get that back on track uh, for next time. But uh, anyway, so not the right camera, not the right aspect. You're missing the, the beautiful view of all the bottles and uh, and stuff from Coxwolds. And I've got to make sure I'm looking at this camera and not the place where my camera should have been. So cheers again. Hmm. I, I, I quite like this, um, uh, this single malt. We'll talk about that in a minute, but what I noticed is that uh, these are all kind of like uh, estate barleys. Yeah, yeah, we've got a, we've got lots to cover over that one because it's quite an exciting aspect of our whiskey. I think that's, um, I mean, that's beyond what people want to see um, on on their whiskey bottle. 
not only all of the, the you know the, the boxes are ticked like it's unchill filtered and it's natural in color, but we get to know exactly where the barley is from. And I'm gathering that's English barley. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Clarity uh, is very, very important to us. We uh, we take that influence from one of our favourite distilleries in Scotland, Brookladdy, in which we try to really embrace the clarity of where we source the barley, down to the name of the farmer, the field, the area of the Cotswolds where we're based, where we source the barley. Uh, yeah, it's very important to us that people have full clarity with everything that we do process-wise. Excellent. Okay, so. Um... Well, let's let's get the uh, the dry gin poured, and uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, Cotswolds Distillery itself and uh, and how that came to be. So uh, fancy fancy black bottle, which is really neat, and uh, it's nice. It's forty six percent ABV, and it also states that it's uh, non chill filtered on uh, on the, the the gin bottle as well, which is pretty impressive. And I'm gonna pour mine. First of all, in just my standard Glen Cairn. And sorry about the pounding. I've told my kids to uh, to cut it out and uh, they're not listening. Oh, oh don't goodness. worry. I've got, oh my goodness. I've got two eight month old puppies. So uh, between your kids and my puppies, I'm sure we'll have some really nice background din. You know, what do you do? Um, yeah. normally, normally I do this in the middle of the night, you know, like starting at around 10 PM because that's when the house is finally quiet. Um, I guess I might have to in, invest in some soundproofing, uh, for this room. Okay. So I've got the, uh, the dry gin here. And, uh, one of the cool things you notice on the bottle is that this won a very, uh, hugely important award, which is uh, pretty amazing. World's well, best London dry, and that was uh, that was in the very early days as well, very very early days, and um, we didn't really anticipate that happening. Um, so just to go back, I guess we'll, we'll let's go back to the inception of Cotswolds Distillery, really. Um, so, as I am a representative of the distillery, our founder and owner Dan, um, he founded the distillery in two thousand and fourteen. Uh, he is an American by birth and has lived in Europe for at least 25 years, um, partly in France, partly in London, uh, working in investment. And to sort of cut a long story short, he was very much an advocate and a huge fan of whiskey after some impromptu uh, tastings at Le Maison de Whiskey in Paris, in which he took a real uh, romantic shine to whiskey the, uh, the stories that these distillers were tell telling, the liquid, of course. And, um, you know, this this encouraged a passion that continued over the years, visiting uh, countless distilleries in uh, in Scotland, especially Isla, um, going back to Brookladdy. Spent a lot of time there speaking with the illustrious Jim McEwen, in which he uh, he actually convinced him and his, his pal to, to buy a cask there and then. So he became a cask owner at Brookladdy in the early days. And then um, that continued for many years. And essentially what happened was a few life choices happened with Dan and his family. Uh, they had a little place in the Cotswolds that they had as a retreat really from the very, very busy lifestyle of working and living in London. And um, it was emerging of two passions. You know, they, they loved coming out to the Cotswolds over weekends and you know, Dan always, always loved a dram and things of that nature. And, you know, his business that he was working in within finance was sort of coming not to an end, but to, uh, to, well, yeah, to an end basically. And various conversations with people uh, such as Jim McEwen up at Brookladdy kind of pushed him in the direction of, well, why not make a whiskey in the Cotswolds? Why not make a whiskey in England? There are barley fields as far as the eye can see when you, uh, when you come to the Cotswolds. It is, Barley fields, fruit orchards, and tiny little Cotswold stone villages, little limestone villages. It's absolutely fantastic. And uh, Dan decided that he would bite the bullet and start making some calls, having some conversations with people that were quite influential within the whiskey community. Uh, Dr. Jim Swan, who we'll talk about later, was one of the main ones. And uh, also Harry Coburn, who had worked at Beaumont for about 25 years. Excuse me. Um, and... 
it was through these conversations with these guys that he was able to be introduced to Forsyth so that he could source the stills and really be able to take what was a dream and implement it as practice. And 2013, everything started to come together plans wise. By 2014, we had stills, a distillery and a dist distillation team that we could then start really putting it, putting everything into practice. And one of the first things that we were able to do whilst we were waiting for the stills to be installed was uh, come up with a gin. And uh, that sort of leads us into our dry gin, which was, it had two, it had two ways, two ways of looking at it really. We are always gonna be a whiskey distillery, but obviously as we know, whiskey needs three years and one day before it enters the barrel to leaving the barrel in order for it to be called a whiskey. And so what we needed and wanted to do as well with some spare time was create a gin. And that's where the London Dry came from. And it also served another purpose of being able to generate a little bit of cash flow early on as well, because, you know, as a startup business, you're creating a product and then three years later is the earliest that you'll be able to bring it to market. And with the gin, you know, you can have a gin done I mean, ours takes about four or five days because of marriage and letting the flavor settle. But yeah, you can have a gin to market very, very quickly. And with our gin, we wanted it to be a mirror of our whiskey in which it represented the area as best possible. Um, we do use a local ingredient. So there is lavender in there, one of the nine botanicals. But obviously we wanted it to be a London dry traditional, you know, nothing too avant-garde in the early stages of what we were releasing. So with our gin, we wanted to make London dry. Uh, juniper doesn't grow fantastically well in the Cotswolds. Um, it does grow, but only to a green state. It doesn't come to full maturation to the point where you can use it in a gin. So we wanted to, uh, we do outsource the juniper and the other botanicals, but we also wanted something that had a texture of whiskey. We wanted those creamy notes. We wanted a really nice oily style and we wanted something that was actually quite prolific and quite big in flavor. So with our gin, we use nine botanicals. The first three are the holy trinity of London dry gin, and that is juniper, angelica, and coriander seeds. So that is always the, uh, the holy trinity of dry gins. And then the citrus element was very important to us as well. Usually most distilleries will use lemon peel, orange peel, but they'll be dry, they'll be irradiated. Um, we didn't want that. We wanted to make something that would create a big flavor and a big aroma. So we decided that we test out fresh zest. And so what we do is still to this day, after all this time, we sit around a table and with potato peelers, peel grapefruits and peel limes so that we're taking all of the fresh zest off of the fruit and we're leaving behind the real flesh. So in that zest, we're able to get fresh oil and that is the flavor and that is the aroma and that is the oiliness that we get in our gin. Um, so we use that on grapefruits and limes. If you ever visit the distillery, there will always be some naked grapefruits and naked limes hanging around free for you to take home um, and juice and use them for whatever you need. Um, it's, it's, I've, done it my, I've done it myself. It's great fun and it adds so much to the gin as well. A local confectionery company make marmalades and, uh, and the yeah. such out of, uh, out of these fruits as well. So it's delicious um and then i, I that, guess that could be a that could be a really good uh, ready to serve drink if you just call it uh, cotswolds uh naked fruits yeah um, yeah I, fruit juice a little bit of uh carbonation and and some gin or some some whiskey it's funny you say that you you hit on something there one of the first cocktails we ever did was uh Faison is French for pheasant, and pheasants are ubiquitous around the around the Cotswolds. They're everywhere. Hence the reason why it's our excuse me, it's on our logo. So that's a pheasant, um, and the faison is basically just like a gin paloma, in which it's gin, grapefruit, lime, and then a bit of effervescence with soda. Um, but the other four botanicals are also a little bit obscure. The lavender, which is local to us, about ten miles down the road from Snow's Hill. Just these wonderful rolling Cotswolds hills that are completely purple during the summer because it's lavender everywhere. Um, and then we also use a little bit of black pepper to balance out the spice, some bay leaf. And it's really just about getting more and more flavor in there as well. So it's quite important to us that we use these botanicals to balance flavor, really. We want, we want citrus, but we don't want it to be a grapefruit or lime gin. We want juniper 
but we need that balanced out with herbs and spices and floral notes as well. So it's, it's really key to us that we, we don't create a specific flavor profile, but a marriage of all of these botanicals so that we can get a really great flavor. And then being a whiskey distillery, we noticed that when we were producing this gin in its test phase, when we were adding ice and adding uh, tonic or dilution, it was looshing, it was going cloudy. Um, so if anyone is watching this and they've got a gin and they've also got some tonic or some ice or both, you know, make a little gin and tonic after you've tasted it neat. But what you'll find is it will go cloudy. It will loosh. There you go. Uh, reasoning for this um, is because we found that we were producing a lot of oil content during distillation. Um, that was coming down to a lot of the fresh citrus peel. And so what we wanted to do was not filter it. You know, that was the that was the cause of the uh, of the clouding. But why is that a bad thing? So for us, it was a case of let's leave it in there. We bottled at forty six percent, which, as all whiskey whiskey fans will know, is the magic number when it comes to non chill filtration. So forty six percent is the perfect ABV to allow oils to remain in suspension and the liquid to remain clear. As soon as you drop below forty six percent, whether that's through dropping the temperature or dropping the ABV through dilution, ice or tonic or both, then those oils will come out of suspension, they will emulsify, they will go cloudy, and that's what you're left with. Um, and we really didn't want to, uh, we didn't want to shy away from that. That's why, again, we're very, very clear about this. It's not a fault. It is just, if we're going to filter out those oils, we're going to filter out flavor. And as a whiskey distillery, we are flavor first. Therefore, if our gin goes cloudy, okay. What's wrong with that? It just means it's more flavorful. The amount yeah, of bartenders in London. As, uh, a little bit cloudy just from the ice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it just means that we're leaving all the flavor in there and we're not stripping it out so that it's completely clear like all the other gins. And we've really embraced that. And I personally think it's fantastic. It means that you can garnish the gin with a fresh pink grapefruit wedge, but really the garnish is the cloudiness because the reality is you can have a bit of ice, a bit of tonic, some gin, and that is still a sensational, flavor, flavor forward, big gin and tonic. It's it's fantastic. I'll just stick with neat for now. Uh, super refreshing, and I'm just having this with club soda, in fact. Yeah. And amazingly, because <clears throat> I kind of don't like the the heavy sweetness I find with some tonics. So amazingly, yeah. just just with club soda. Um, it's a, a very refreshing, full-flavored, uh, def definitely lovely summer beverage. Cheers. Cheers to you, sir. Absolutely. There we go. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, this is this is just, you know, with or, with or without this on my, excuse me, with or, with or without this on my chest, it is hands down one of my favorite gin and tonics because my preferred uh, way of drinking it is in a tumbler, 50-50 with tonic and ice, and it is just a pure flavor bomb. And I think um, it's going to do really lovely once nightclubs open again because uh, any any type of black light is yeah. is going to just shine this thing up like uh, like a uh, like a neon sign. I think. Yeah, it's just like a luminescent uh, sort of siren, really. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a great gin, you know. And that was that was the first thing that we ever brought to market, and we're even to this day. Even when the gin boom is still thriving, but people do have what they call gin fatigue in some areas, mainly bartenders, um, in the UK anyway, it's a good gin. And if it's a timeless classic flavor-wise, then it will withstand the test of time in any sort of gin boom that does or doesn't happen. And we're very, very proud of this gin because it just stays true to what it is, a good juniper forward London dry gin. Mm -hmm, very nice. Um, I don't do this very often, but I think I'm going to give this a little bit of a, a, a gin hug and a little gin kiss as well. Very nice Quite right. stuff. Uh, Quite really right. excellent. Uh, this is available in Alberta, in Canada. Uh, I think the price is um, uh, not too expensive. I think uh, Greg Winters, who is chatting along with us, uh, might share a little bit about uh, the typical price point in Alberta. And I'm not sure if it's available in, in Ontario or other provinces, but um, maybe he'll uh, share a little comment about that. And we'll put that one aside. And then I have one more gin to look at together with you, and then we'll get into uh, the the four 
outstanding, mind-blowing whiskeys that uh, that are sitting here staring at me in the face saying, drink me, drink me. But before that, um, this is a definite um, eye-catching bottle, eye-catching label, and a very, very interesting looking product. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm really curious about um, uh, this Cotswolds number one. And I had a little bit last night as uh, kind of like a bit of a study to um, get ready for this. And it's, uh, boy, it's just excellent as well. And I think this as well is really a, a sipping gin. But I'll let you tell me a little bit about what I'm, what I'm looking at here as I get that poured. So what we have with our Wildflower Gin, um, it's been a long time coming with Wildflower Gin because we are big fans of the spritz, you know, the Aperol spritz or any kind of spritz you want. Um, and what we were finding and Negronis and the general aperitif digestif culture that exists in Italy, we're huge fans of that. And we really wanted something that was an homage to it. You know, we're not trying to take on the Italian market but we wanted to make something that would fit within that criteria, but also fit within the criteria of being from the Cotswolds. So what we were able to do was um, we created a, it's still a gin. The most important thing is you see the color and you don't assume that it's below 40% or 80, 80 proof, which means that usually it's, if it's below those, uh, those proofs or the ABV, it means that it's a liqueur and it's had sugar added to it. And, you know, what we wanted to do is make sure it's still what we call a full fat gin. So this is 41.7 or 83 proof. M Matt isn't my forte. Yeah, um, and what, Yep, and there we go. And uh, what we wanted to do was make sure that it was still uh, at its very core, a London dry gin, but we wanted to use some of the wildflowers that grow in the meadows of the Cotswolds as well. So as well as our lavender, we we're also able to get in there uh, um, some corn flowers, not corn flower, but corn flowers, the wonderful little purple flowers. Um, they grow around the meadows, especially around the Cotswolds. Um, I, there's some wonderful places around the uh, Worcestershire area that have meadows as well, and the Stratford-upon-Avon area, wonderful meadows like that. And then we were able to use as well some rhubarb root, a little bit of um, orange in there just to bring the citrus elements out. And then we were able to layer it over a London dry gin. So still a gin. Loads and loads of floral flavor, flavors, a little bit of bitterness in there as well. And a gin that, unlike the Aperol Spritz, where you had to add Prosecco and add soda, we wanted to create something that with a gin backbone, you could add a tonic, a premium mixer of some sort that could create the Spritz without having to use another two products. Um, so that's what we use with our Wildflower number one. It is one of three that we've created, but this is definitely the one that is emblematic of the Spritz. And um, it doesn't have to stick with just regular Indian tonic as well. I don't know about in Canada, but over here in the UK, there is a boom of flavored tonics, whether it's elderflower or Mediterranean or all the flavor profiles seem to be covered. And we found that an array of these tonics or mixers or sodas work fantastically well with this wildflower gin. I mean, and the other great it's, thing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing just without water as well. Mm. It still has that bitterness as well, which means that, you know, a Negroni fan can see some uh, use in there as well. One thing that I found as well um, is that it works fantastically well. And I think this is the only gin that I've ever found that has that is that it works fantastically well with orange juice. And it's almost reminiscent of the classic Italian cocktail, the Garibaldi, which is classically Campari with a little bit of sugar with some whipped up uh, fresh orange juice. So it's kind of a little bit foamy and it's got that wonderful sort of pink sunrise sort of aesthetic. If you do that with this wildflower, it's like a gin Garibaldi and it's absolutely mm. mind blowing. It's a great drink. And there just aren't many gins in which if you speak to some newcomers to the category and they say, oh, I don't really like tonic or I don't really like dry gin. You say, how about a gin and orange juice? And it's still, you can still taste it. It's fantastic. So what is that um, uh, quite bittersweet, um, uh, flavor that that I'm getting here. So you'll get a little bit of gentian in there as well. So that adds the bitterness mm. to it as well. So gentian and rhubarb root will be the bitterness. Uh, the floral notes from the lavender and the cornflowers. Uh, orange zest is very, very prominent all the way through there. 
And then, like yes, I say, yes. you will still get those London dry notes, right? The backbone is still a London dry as well. So that's that will add to the dry bitterness of it as well. Hmm. Lovely. Um, well, I, I hate to, uh, uh, to, to dump this, but I've only got one glass handy. And if, if I consume all of these, um, I'll be out of my mind by the end of our stream. So let me just uh, go like that. And start with some fresh ice here. All right. Oh yeah, that's a big mess I just made. Okay, so it looks oh, great look, as well. Look at how it uh, it pinks up the ice too. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? It works so well. During last summer, I was making I was making Negroni like blended slushies with it. <laughs> so you just get a lot of crushed ice, a little bit of orange juice, a bit of Campari, a bit of sweet vermouth and some wildflower. Um, and then just blitz it up in the blender and then pour it into a big old uh, copa glass. And it was it was just summertime in a glass. It was great. Cheers to you, Rob. Cheers to you, sir. Thank you very much. Of course, I left my stir stick upstairs. I can see all the uh, the strong gin down here and the uh, club soda up here. Uh, be like Gaz Regan, God rest his soul, the man that made the finger Negroni foot. There you go. You know exactly <laughs> what to do. Hmm. Um, with ice and water, the the club soda. It is. Um, it's actually a bit of a lighter, fresher. Uh, fruitier take than the the dry gin, so really interesting that um, uh, though though it's it seems very very potent and uh, fruit forward in the glass with uh, with just club soda you get a really light um, fresh again still very fruity but uh, really really yeah. different from the dry gin on ice. Yeah, and what we also wanted to create was something that would allow people to be introduced to our brand that may have a different style of palette as well. What we were finding was we'd go to various gin shows or speak to various consumers and the pink gin or colored gin scene seems to be a very good bridge for people that say they didn't like gin because they may have had like a, a not very good green bottle gin and tonic 20, 30 years ago. Um, and this was just a good way of introducing people to the brand as well. So it's been really great to sort of see more and more people coming on board with the Cotswolds Distillery due to this product as well. You know, not, not to age myself. I mean, uh, well, anyway, I'm, I'm 46, but there was a period there in my, in my 20s when gin was just massively huge, uh, almost more so than, uh, than, than whiskey. And... Um, uh, there were all these different London gins that were coming to Canada and, you know, I would, I would just buy them all and we'd serve martinis with, with friends at parties and stuff like this. <clears throat> but um, uh, as a, as an early gin lover, I can say that these are absolutely gins that I would like to have on my yeah. shelf. And I'm not saying that because, uh, because uh, these bottles were all uh, uh, gifted uh, to the channel but uh, but because actually they taste amazing, and um, I think I'm going to take this. I'm actually heading to uh, to South Korea next week, and I'm gonna I'm gonna seal that up and take that to uh, to my sister-in-law, and uh, hopefully she'll uh, freak out with the amazingness, deliciousness of this bottle. So I'll send you some recipes for some good wildflower oh, Garibaldi's. Be great. Please do. Please do. Yeah. And if there's anything specific that I need to take with me, then I'll have to get it here because it's really hard finding um, uh, cocktail ingredients in, in Seoul. I think that's the beauty of simplistic drinks. Um, you don't need to have, find anything obscure. And that's why we love the wildflower as well as a good premium mixer is all you need. <clears throat> Whatever shape or form that takes, it does work. And most places do have good quality orange juice. So you're pretty safe with that and there premium tonics of that nature as well excellent okay well that was wonderful i think i needed a little bit of a swish of club soda i think i'll do the same
And uh, uh, right, Greg is reminding us that there's also um, wildflower gin number two and number three. So I guess different flowers, is that the idea there? Yeah, and uh, also taking influence from different styles of aperitif in, uh, in Italy. Yeah, using different flowers, but also we wanted them to be, again, homages, not, not rip-offs or anything like that, because you can never get anywhere near the recipes that the, the classics are. You know, uh, this one very much stands in the spritz category. It's not an Aperol, it's not a Campari, but that's whatever. Um, but with Wildflower 2, we definitely created an homage to, uh, to Sue's. The, uh, the gentian liqueur that you can find a lot over the, over the water. And then we're also huge fans of chartreuse made by the monks mm -hmm. in Chambry. And um, we wanted to do something that was an homage to them, concentrating a little bit more on uh, the herbal side of it. And uh, yeah, it was, they've been really successful. Yeah, speaking of chartreuse, that's another uh, um, uh, category or type of spirit that I'd like to make sure that I, that I pick up uh, just for cocktail use and just for studies, because it's uh, uh, it's something so um, so um, historic and almost legendary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a, f a few friends of mine have worked as ambassadors for Chartreuse over the years, and they say the same thing. You know, the story, the setup, the monks, the flavors, the the secret recipes, the history is incredible. You can't even cover it in one sitting. It's incredible. For, for a while there, I was worried that some of these um, uh, really herbaceous and time intensive, um, uh, you know, liqueurs or aperitifs were, were at risk of kind of disappearing just because, um, uh, you know, there wasn't a, a young crowd of, of people willing to get into that, that industry and, yeah. and do the massive work that it takes. I remember watching... Um, uh, a video about um, the makers of a certain French um, liqueur that's made in the mountains, and they're they're digging up these roots every year and scrubbing them and washing them and and so on and so forth, preparing them for uh, uh, for use in distillation. And uh, so you know, I was worried, but it's interestingly how amazingly quickly um, the uh, the millennial generation and then the generations to follow seem to have have embraced all of these wonderful organic natural um, craft distill distilling techniques and have really jumped into it with uh, uh, not just with two feet but with two feet and uh, two feet and two hands into that uh, uh, that industry again so pretty amazing yeah I think gin and whiskey has a lot to answer for in that respect it's brought a lot of people to spirits in general not just to the overall categories mm. totally. All right. Well, uh, without further ado, it is time to get into uh, the, the Cotswolds Distillery uh, whiskey categories. We'll have four of them today. You can see them in the link below, uh, either if you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, you'll find uh, each, 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 uh, each of the varieties of whiskeys that we'll be trying, each expression. That's the word I was stumbling to look for. So we've got the 46% uh, Cotswolds uh, they're the standard single malt. This one is the 2014 edition. And uh, then we'll get into some really high octane single malts like this uh, Founder's Choice. And uh, what, what I thought was really impressive for me was that uh, beyond, it seems like beyond your, your standard single malt whiskey, everything is... Uh, seems to be i'm not sure i mean there may be some others that are 46 percent, but it seems like there's a whole lot of cask strength releases that you're putting out which uh, which is impressive this one by the way is 60.9 percent, and then the uh the sherry sherry cask is 57.4 um so another cask strength beauty and the final whiskey we'll try tonight is the peated cask which is also, I think, over 60 at 60.2 percent. So, really impressive, and that's a, I think, I think a big, a big um, benefit for for uh, for whis uh, single malt whiskey lovers that you're putting them on a cask strength. Did you want to speak on that maybe for a minute before we get into these? Well, yeah, 100 percent, absolutely. Um, 
you know, the, the, the true the true basis of a uh, great whiskey is always good liquid going into good wood. So good casking, good good new make spirit means that you're always going to have a great outcome. And as we get into the whiskies a little later, I'll expand on that. But what we found was even though we're casking at 63.5%, we found that in over a short amount of time, we were getting great releases from the spirit. And we didn't think that we needed the water to dumb down anything because the flavor profile of the whiskeys coming out of the cask was was great. And it was a great representation of what we're doing as well, um, especially the founder's choice showcasing the STR cask, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, yes. Yeah, 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 I'm excited as well. Um, yeah, the STR cask was is just such a fantastic active style of cask that it, it brings out all of the flavor that you want from the cask, from the spirit, from the distillery, that why try and dumb it down? There's, there's, there's no real need. But the other great thing is if you do have that inclination, you can have it at various different AB, ABVs and the flavor profile will alter, but in a very, very positive way. So that's why we always think, if we start at a high ABV with the Founders Choice, the P, well, Founders Choice mainly, you can add a couple of drops, a drop, you know, a teaspoon of water, and you'll just get different flavor profiles starting to open up, and it's quite exciting in that manner. So why not start at a high strength when it's super delicious? And one of the main feedbacks I've always get from presenting this whiskey as well is it doesn't taste 60%. It tastes more like it's 50%, which means that, you know, it's delicious and you still get that nice little kick. Um, a very nice little um, uh, super chat donation from Graham Young. He says, bring on that whiskey. Uh, he thinks the gin would be a hit in his house as well. Uh, cheers to you, Graham. Thanks for watching. I know it's the middle of the day. You may even be at work. And if so, you are a trooper. Thank you very much. Good on you, Graham. Good on you. Now, um, let's backtrack and get into this uh, uh, basic. I hate saying the word basic, but your 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 standard, your ubiquitous. Flagship. It's flagship. our flagship. Thank you, flagship, flagship yeah. single malt. And the thing that screamed at me on the label is that, and it's it's right over here, which is in very small letters. And that should be, I think, if there's a, a redesign, I would really love to see this. Uh, first fill barrels um, identified a little bit more largely on the label because because that's really important for, for whiskey lovers, knowing that this is first fill barrels. So that's really, really impressive. And uh, I'll tell you right off the bat, you're, you're welcomed by beautiful vanilla notes, um, some caramel, but also I think, is there also some sherry casks in this uh, record? No. Nope. You would think it. You you you're right to think it. Uh, yeah. It is the overall split is seventy percent STR cask, so that's mm. a red wine cask that's been shaved, toasted, and recharred, and then thirty percent of it is first fill bourbon. That's impressive. Okay, so we've got red wine cask, which is giving it this uh, uh, caramel tinged fruit note, and then you got this beautiful vanilla backbone and. Um, what I really enjoy from what I, what I drink myself, um, we're talking, we're talking, um, for example, when Morangi Astar would be a very similar kind of flavor profile, which is a, a first fill um, a bourbon barrel release from Glen Morangi. But then also, it's kind of like Deanston, where you, you get more. Um, uh, soft yeah. fruity notes. Absolutely, uh, soft fruity notes, but also some uh, uh, some campfire um, marshmallows. Yeah, which is uh, we should stick a pin in that flavor note because we're going to come back to that at the end of the tasting with another one of our releases as well. But Sounds you're good. you're you're bang on the money with that one. Um, yeah, so this is our flagship whiskey first released in 2017. Um, as Mark said, it is a combination of red wine STR cask, all first fill, and um, ex-bourbon cask. The ex-bourbon cask is, um, the ex-bourbon cask, sorry, that's my brother. Um, the ex-bourbon cask is from um, Basil Hayden's. And what we find is 
they don't steam the barrels which means that we get wet barrels from the uh from the cooperage so that you know i'm sure people are aware of this but bourbon barrels are often steamed within an inch of their life just so that we can actually get they get as much bourbon out of there as possible whereas um with the barrels that we get from basil hayden's it is all just wet barrels they leave everything in there and bourbon casks can actually retain sometimes in between five and seven liters of liquid within the actual grain of the barrel which means that we're getting all of those wonderful fresh big flavors from the bourbon and it really does add a deep intense richness to the style of whiskey but then that's just the backbone the real crux of the uh, of the uh, of the whiskey is the red wine str cask and that gives it its fruity notes um i guess if we if we go backwards actually we should really talk about our distillation process and where we get the barley from because you know if we start with that with the flagship we've got a basis for when we talk about the other whiskies so uh, as mark alluded to 100 percent cotswolds barley the cotswolds is an area of outstanding natural beauty and that is in the sort of southwest of england um, it spans from just below stratford upon avon all the way down to around about bath and then over to oxford and um there are barley fields as i said absolutely everywhere now we name the bar the farm on the bottle where we source the barley from so right there you've got barrington park farm that's near the cotswolds wildlife park um our current releases which are a little bit more um recent they're from Aikman Street Farm, which is uh, a tenanted farm on the Blenheim Estate, Blenheim Palace being where Winston Churchill was born. Um, and we're very, very clear about where we source the barley from. We've only used three farms so far for our whiskey release. And uh, it was Bradwell Grove, Barrington Park Farm, and Aikman Street. And uh, we even know the names of the farmers over, over Aikman. That's Mike and Phil Green. Um, and it's all about being able to source it and have the full clarity of that. We also do 100% floor maltings. So it's not a percentage or, and then some of it is through mechanical. I think it's just us and Springbank, which is a pretty cool company that do 100% floor maltings on all of their whiskey. Um, and that's done down about 60 miles south of the distillery um, near Bath in a place called Warminster, which is also England's oldest, um, oldest maltings. Once that's done and the uh, barley is wonderful and germinated, it'll come up to the distillery. And in our distillery, we will then um, grind it down to a grist. We will then put it into mash. And from mashing, we'll go into dist uh, fermentation. Now, fermentation is where it gets really, really interesting because we sort of start to not break the rules, but just go that little extra, that little bit further to get more flavor. So we're going to go instead of, the, instead of the industry standard of two day fermentation, We'll go for a four day fermentation. And then also what we'll do is we'll pitch two yeast strains um, just so that we can, we'll use anchor and we'll use fermenters so that we can get a good yield, but we'll also get a yield of very, very funky, fruity style esters that will really start to generate that fruity flavor that we're, uh, that we're pursuing through the process. Um, and by the time the first fermentation is done, then it will start to essentially really start to create those those funky oils and esters for the next two days. Um, and then after that, we have traditional foresight stills created for us by the foresight family up in Scotland. They even came down and did the installation for us at the distillery. And Proud Mary is our wash still. She will create our low wines. Um, if you ever come down to the distillery, there's usually some bluegrass of some sort playing in the background. And so uh, Proud Mary, our wash still, she keeps on rolling. And then, uh, and then our spirit still is Janice. And what we wanted to do with our end distillate was be able to have something that was very, very fruity. Um, the Cotswolds is a very mellow place. It's got fruit orchards everywhere and barley fields. And I thought, well, not me personally, but Jim Swan and Dan, Thought that that would be a good way to sort of transcend that message as a flavor profile very mellow very fruity uh, and very grain based as well so what we do is we take a very very small but high heart cut from our distillation in which we're able to uh, retain those fruit flavors so of our um of our overall wash we only end up with about 250 liters um of spirit to which we will then marry into a tank 
ready to go into our uh, ready to go into our, our our barrels. So we're making a very very fruity style spirit. We even have it bottled. It's that delicious. We have it actually as a. I don't know whether it's available in Canada. I don't think it is. But here we go. So that is our. That's our new make spirit. That's called the white pheasant, and that's sixty-three point five percent, and that is not quite what comes off the stills because it's a little bit higher in ABV, not by much, but a little bit. Um, and this is what we put in our barrels at that strength to then create Cotswolds whiskey once it's ready. Um, and then, yeah, a majority of what we do is um, STR cask filling, and then we also do so about thirty-five percent STRs. About 35%, 40% bourbon, first fill. And then we have some experimental casks that we use for other releases that we can talk about later. Um, casking at 63.5%. And then it's really just about making sure that the flavor comes around and the color comes around and the oxidation and the interaction with the barrel. Um, you'll notice that the color on this is, I mean, it's more, it's more prevalent in the bottle. But as you can see, that color through the STRs and the bourbon, it's all natural. So we don't add any caramel E150, anything of that nature. We don't chill filter. 46% ABV is uh, is as low as we'll ever go on a whiskey um, because we don't chill filter again, like we said with the gin. We don't want to take away any of that flavor. So what we do with the whiskey is we keep it non-chill filtered, 46%. Um, Odyssey barley right here in the Cotswolds. And it's just a, a really great, fruity, easy drinking style of, uh, of whiskey, but also full of flavor, loads and loads of texture and length as well. It carries on on the palate for such a long time afterwards. It does have a really oily mouthfeel, which is yeah. fantastic. And, um, <clears throat> Everything about this just screams top shelf. And um, again, forgive me, um, I didn't research the price point of this in Canada, but um, you know, I would be very happy to, to pick this up for, um, let's say, $100 Canadian, plus or minus. And I think um, um, it's... Um, even though even though the spirit is younger, it's got it's got more oomph in a way than um, uh, some of the whiskeys that I mentioned about this. Uh, the similarities like Glenmorangie or or Deanston, um, and uh, even interestingly, this is very similar to a certain um, uh, a certain Taiwanese bourbon 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 cask uh, release. From from Cavillan, which is their forty six percent bourbon yeah. bourbon oak. Yeah, there is a correlation there as well that we'll talk about with the next whiskey. Very important correlation. But it's um, it's just a great great whiskey, and I think that the light fruit flavors, the spirit is there, but the spirit is there to add flavor. It doesn't add an astringency. It's it's there just adding more of a multi backbone and base to it as well. Um, and you know, for for a lot of people, it's a great gateway whiskey. And by that, I mean people that don't really like to drink whiskey, or you know, we hear the phrase a lot in the UK. I don't know about in Canada, but a lot of people that say, "I want to like whiskey," mm -hmm. but they just haven't found that that entry level style. And I don't want to use entry level, but I think that the flavor profile, you know, the the, the sweetness, the malt, the grain, but then also apricots and peaches and apples and butter and things of that nature would mean that their flavor profiles people can really get on board with. And it's just an easy style drink. All right, so uh, Yarka uh, Winters just mentioned that this is from anywhere between 78 to $90 Canadian, which is is super reasonable. Um, again, it's 46% EBV, it's unchill filtered, it is uh, uh, natural in color. It's also single estate barley. So if you're looking for uh, for craft, this is about as craft as it gets um, at that price point. There's nothing more craft than there's nothing else you can do. Uh, you've mentioned the long fermentation. You've mentioned um, uh, the careful distillation. So um, this is really um, uh, the the epitome of craft distillation 
for yeah. uh, for, for the world, which is awesome. So that's great. And um, well, just, go on, you, you go first. Well, no, I was I was just going to chime in. Someone once said to me, you know, uh, making whiskey is is all about making decisions at crucial points. Um, down to what barley you use, how long is your fermentation, the mash, what stills you use, what cut points you take, um, and then the barrels that you use as well. So what we try to do is at every single juncture in which you're going to make a decision about the process that will be the resulting spirit in your whiskey, we wanted to make sure that we took it from a quality standpoint and not a commercial standpoint, which I'm sure Dan at some point at some points he says, oh, I wish I'd done that a bit differently. But at the end of it, we wanted to make a quality whiskey as opposed to something that was just done for money. And that's what we've, what, that's what we've created, a whiskey that really does show its quality at every single juncture in the production. Um, well, I'll just pan this way a little bit. Just so uh, I can see something here. There we go. Oh, cool. Little alambic. Yes, and that's my the smaller of the two that I have. And uh, uh, let's let's say there's a little bit of um, experimentation that goes on. And uh, I, you know, it's 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 not as easy as you think. And uh, I'm I'm super careful if I'm if I'm experimenting with uh, with these things. But uh, I had someone gift me something made locally. There's two different people, three different people. Uh, two of them were done excellently well, but one of them, I don't know what, I don't know what happened, but uh, it just tasted like, like dirty socks and, um, uh, and unwashed feet. And, and I thought to myself, I can't, I can't swallow this because I don't even know, I don't know who made this. I don't know if they were paying attention. It's a very difficult process when you mentioned the specific point in um, uh, in the, the creation of spirits, um, so it's uh, I think it takes uh, it takes years to really develop that that knowledge, especially even if you have the the, the chemical background, you still need to to uh, have the uh, let's say one hundred or one thousand trials and error before you say okay, yeah, this is how it's done, you know. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, that was a bit of a segue. Well, let's get into the very next uh, uh, whiskey, which is a cask strength, and that's the founder's choice. Oh yes, oh yes. This is uh, this is a firm favorite in our household, and quite a bit darker than the um, uh, the uh, uh, flagship bottle. Uh, I, I don't think the camera here can really show. Uh, the difference in color, but it's about uh, uh, it's like it's like amber versus oak in terms of color. Yeah, yeah. So with the founder's choice, we're um, we're very very proud of this, and uh, the founder's choice tells a, a story that takes us back to the beginning of our our uh, our creation, our inception as well, and uh, Dan's relationship with Dr. Jim Swan, who. In the whiskey world was is will always be an absolute legend when it comes to uh, spirit interaction with oak flavor profiles and really bringing new world whiskey to the forefront from a quality standpoint more than anything and this bottle is completely dedicated to dr jim swan what he did for whiskey what he did with flavor and most importantly what he did with us as well very very important man um he was there at the beginning with Dan, um, making a lot of decisions that were crucial to our flavor profile and working alongside Harry Coburn, as I said, you know, over 25 years with Beaumont and then with, within the whiskey industry. I think between the two of them, you're looking at nearly 70 to 80 years of experience within Scotch whiskey. The two of those really were the the factor that made us not just a new distillery stabbing in the dark hoping for the best and getting lucky but actually being able to dial in our process our engineering our um our distillation finding the right cut points and then also finding the right casks the uh the red wine str cask um is something that was a creation of jim swans he created it with um with a bodega in portugal and 
what you have with that cask is, and I'm going to allude to the cask because it's quite pivotal towards the whiskey, is that you have American oak barrels that have been used in red wine in warmer climates. So whether it is, um, whether it, it's wine in the Alentejo, south of Portugal, the Douro Valley, um, and wine, not port, but um, also wines in Rioja. And then they've also sourced American, uh, American oak from you know, wineries in Napa and Israel. If it's a warmer climate where they use American oak, they source those barrels at the cooperage. And then the process is to shave out the interior of the, uh, of the barrel. Um, Ian Chang, told me that that is to get rid of any sort of wet residue that will create amino acids that could cause a sulfuric reaction with the spirit when aging. Uh, anyone that has had red wine cask whiskey or has been experienced red wine cask whiskey, sometimes there is a bit of a whiff of sulfur if it hasn't gone well. Um, and what this did was it gave a consistency when using those red wine barrels. But what that also did was it allowed the grains of the oak to absorb more spirit. So if you think about wine, and the the viscous nature of wine it's it's a lot thicker than spirit white spirit um so wine will only ever penetrate down into the grains of the oak maybe four to five millimeters that's four two five not four to five um whereas spirit will go even further so it'll go six to seven millimeters into the grains of the oak which means that when the spirit is in the barrel and it's oxidizing you know the barrels breathing it into the staves and breathing it back out it's really getting the American oak, it's getting the red wine. And so what we found was shaving out the inside and then charring, no, sorry, toasting it at a high temperature, which caramelized all of the sugars that exist in the oak, and then charring it to seal in all of those flavors created. You were getting American oak flavors, red wine flavors, the charring was adding natural color, but also a filtration as well. So when the spirit is in this red wine STR cask and it's breathing in and out with the oak and oxidizing, it's really working hard. It's taking on the color, the sweetness, the flavor profiles. And, you know, we're achieving this color within 12 months without anything artificial. It's completely natural process. And then it's just through evaporation and oxidize, ox, oxidization for the further few years that we're really creating a flavor with the STR cask that is, it's unlike anything else, but it's completely natural. It's, it's, I said it this on a tasting the other week, and it's basically sometimes whiskey can go, or new make can go into a barrel and it just goes to sleep. It goes to settle down. When new make spirit goes into an STR cask, it is going to work. It is an active cask that is really, really going to work with every single element of that process. And the outcome, cheers to Jim Swan, is this whiskey right here. This is cask strength, 100% STR cask, and it is a phenomenal dram. Cheers to you, Mark. Here we cheers. go. What an aroma. So what proportion of SCR are we looking at here? 100% first fill. Oh, my goodness. So 100% yeah, full, full term SCR red wine casks. Yeah, full term as well. That We don't any, do any finishing. Any idea what kind of wood we're looking at here? Is it American oak or... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oak? It's 100% American oak, yeah. So they always use American oak just because they find that the flavor profile that it imparts is a, a little bit sweeter as well. And it balances the flavors whereas obviously when you're using european oak you're going to get a little bit more tannin and spice in there the sweeter flavors from the american oak just create something that's quite special with the red wine fruit and it really uh, straddles the the two kind of factions of um sherry cask and bourbon cask i think a, a bourbon cask lover will enjoy this as well as uh, the uh, the sherry bomb lover will really appreciate the, the flavor that they're getting from uh, from a whiskey like uh, like this um, founder's choice. But, I think uh, the flavor profile as well. With you know, you got chocolate, cinnamon spice. You got some toffee notes in there. Um, I always get some really really dark chocolate notes. Um, it's just a really great whiskey, some fudge, some caramel, but then also you just get those savory notes, a bit of red wine. 
it is um it's just a really good drum interesting comment from uh from doc here uh he uh supposes he makes a supposition that sdr casks have less extractable so you have more subtracted maturation <clears throat> and i think he's talking about the fact that that uh that you've got a charring going on so you'll have uh, an extra layer of char uh, after you've stripped uh, stripped the uh, the STR the stripped uh, ST strips. What is post strip post rechar? Shaved, shaved or stripped? Shaved, uh, yes. Toasted and recharred. Yeah. So uh, the the charring will will give definitely some subtractive maturation. In other words, yeah. uh, you'll have uh, uh, the the carbon of that char. Uh, pulling out some, let's say, some uh, less less desirable qualities from the whiskey. Yeah, it's it, it's an element of filtration, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah that uh, is exactly it. But uh, now, you know, so this is uh, at least three years old, uh, 2018, batch two, 2018. So maybe it's three, or maybe it's four years old, according to. Yeah, r roughly about three, three, three and a half years old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. At some point, uh, as you say, because of the fact that you get about six or seven milliliters into the wood, at some point the whiskey is going to be reaching that uh, uh, that that new wood inside yes. the char. Yeah. So you'll have uh, both, I think, both subtractive, uh, subtractive, but also you'll have uh, some extractive where where uh, some yeah. of the qualities of the wood are coming into the whiskey. Yeah, it's a combination of the both, really. I would say that, yeah, whilst whilst you do have a filtration with the charring, so you do have that subtractive maturation, uh, you also have the elements from the toasting that give you more access to uh, what flavors are able to create through the barrel as well, which is quite important. But absolutely chocolate, uh, actually less chocolate and more cocoa, cocoa and cinnamon. Yeah, uh, cacao, but, sort of like dark cacao. Yes, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of Christmas flavors in there. Totally. And unlike uh, straight red wine casks, uh, you don't really have the... Uh, um, you don't have the bright fruitiness, but you're getting something darker and uh, uh, it's hard to put a, put a, 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 it's hard to verbalize exactly what I'm tasting here, but. Um, it's uh, almost like a, a Black Forest Gatto in which you've got an element of bright red fruit in there, but then it marries and works really well with the darker cacao fudge toffee style flavors as well. Uh, you really uh, verbalize that very well. I'm going to add a tad of water here. Yeah, please do. Actually, Again, going back to what I said with the different ABVs, be it a drop, a teaspoon, or uh, even a, a cube of ice, should anyone have that inclination, it brings out so many different flavors that it's quite an exciting whiskey because you can really variate what you're going to get from it. Because I've just moved, I haven't actually... Um, arranged my bar well enough uh i, I misplaced my glen cairn water jug so uh i find though if you are using a, a water like this use the cap because the cap is actually pretty um pretty precise with drop so expertly tricky. done okay let's see how this does with water And of course, as I am sipping this, uh, sorry, as I'm nosing this with water, uh, Peter Burns, um, who is, uh, let's say, a, um, a big guy over at um, uh, Craft Cellars in Alberta, uh, he mentions that he really recalls loading uh, butterscotch. Excuse me. Yeah. And uh, what I'm finding with water is that with water, you really do get a little bit of butterscotchy type of a, a note there. Um, 
like Werther's or something like that. Yeah, Werther's is a good one. I think going back to what you said earlier as well, this is, uh, especially with a bit of water, this is where it becomes a little bit more applicable to the bourbon drinker because of those butterscotch round creamy notes coming yes. through. And the, um, uh, the campfire marshmallows. Yeah, still holding on to that one. <laughs> I love it with, um, um, sorry, I love it neat, but I, I think I really enjoy this with just, I think that was about um, three or four drops or about a third of a milliliter of, of water that I added to uh, 20, 20 odd milliliters of, uh, of the founder's choice. Yeah, I mean, with the STR cask, it's not something that's exclusive to the Cotswolds distillery. I mean, if anything, it was made more famous by the Taiwanese distillery Cavalan. Um, if you ever get the opportunity and uh, ever want to splash out a few hundred dollars or pounds, the Cavalan Vineyard Barrique, which was Jim Swan's first first showing of the um, red wine STR cask when he worked with Ian Chang over there. And the Vineyard Barrique is 100% STR cask with the spirit of Cavalan. And uh, I even think, and I, I might be wrong, but I think that was the bottle used on the show Billions when Paul Giamatti's with his wife and he said, wow, those Taiwanese are really making good stuff. Um, but great it's a show, sensation. Great show. great show, but, you know, the fact that they had Cavalan on there as well, was kudos for me. Totally. And uh, Paul Giamatti, what a guy, right? Right, exactly, exactly. But yeah, the SDR cask, it was also Jim Swan's, it was his creation. Therefore, whenever he worked with new distilleries, he always took that red wine SDR cask with him. And it was a way of allowing younger distilleries to show their spirit in a very, very positive way. It's not like, you know, you taste the whiskey and go, that's just STR. It still allows the spirit of the distillery to come through so that you can actually recognize the, uh, the true essence of the distillery through through the um, through the maturation through the barrel, and is it Lindor, Lindor's farm, Nabneen, um, Penderin, Milk and Honey in Israel, to name but a few are the distilleries that have worked with Jim Swan and have also embraced the STR cask. Now I am um, I'm coming at this now. I've doubled down on the water, so I put in about um, another four or five drops. So we're nearing about a milliliter added. The first thing that's coming to my, my brain is the uh, um, dark chocolate mint, like a like a little uh, little patty, you know, like a, like a the dark chocolate, the green mint, and then the dark chocolate little sandwich chocolate. Well, like a, I think in the UK we call them an after eight. Kind of like after eight, but um, uh, just think darker darker chocolate and. Uh, uh, less less sweet. Yeah, I get that, especially on the nose as well. <clears throat> especially on the nose. Yeah, because it's it, it's bright, but it's intense in those sort of darker, um, sort of lactic, creamy, chocolatey, cacao style mm -hmm. aromas as well. Yeah, the water really. I mean, again, I'll, I'll say it for the third time. We've tried it at various ABVs, and whilst we love it at 60, uh, 60.9, point nine. It shows really well at different ABVs as well. It's fantastic. Now, um, I guess you know, because I was so late, we have uh, we're we're already at about. I've already taken an hour and forty minutes of your time. Uh, do we have a bit more time to get through the the final couple of uh, of whiskeys? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And again, to anybody who's watching that. Uh, uh, that was wondering what happened. Um, my uh, uh, my what was it? Seven seven hundred dollar camera. Just I couldn't find it. My computer could not find this camera, and um, and then it couldn't even find the native camera. And I had to shut it down like numerous times before finally I could see some uh, uh, some camera availability just with the native camera on my laptop which is a terrible camera and uh, it's going to suffer as a, uh, as a uh, uh, previously recorded live stream because of this shitty camera. But uh, what do you do? So, okay. So the next thing we're going to look at together, 
and that is wonderful pink label Cotswold single malt whiskey called Sherry Cask. Yep. And likewise, this is also a, a quite a, a dark number. So um, we've definitely got something that's way darker than probably 90% uh, of whiskeys on the shelves. Um, and very much in company with probably Macallan 18 would be about that dark. Uh, Macallan 12 wouldn't even be this dark, which is interesting. So we'll get that opened here. Let's not drop any names to draw comparisons, though, of course. Whoops. whoops. <laughs> okay. So this would be uh, one of our most recent commercial releases. Uh, we released it about a year ago. And um, you know, you're always going to make a sherry cask. If you're a whiskey maker, there will be a sherry cask. It, car. It is the um, it's the inevitable, really. And we wanted to make something that was our own our own uh, our own take on the sherry cask. We haven't done anything different or uh, anything anything uh, out of the ordinary. But we wanted to use a combination of sherry casks so that we could create a flavour that was balanced. Um, I know that Dan has also said that for each batch of sherry cask that we release, they will be different. Um, so what we've done with uh, what we've done with this is we've used a combination of Spanish and American oak, and they're also a combination of hogsheads and sherry butts as well. So you've got American Spanish oaks hogsheads and a combination of American and Spanish oak um, sherry butts that have had Oloroso and Pedro Yemenet in there as well. So I think we used about 18, 19 casks all in all in total. Um, the, like I say, the two sherries were Oloroso and Pedro Yemenet, and they were a combination of American oak, Spanish oak, hoghead, hogshead, and um, sherry butts as well. So about 25% of the overall uh, whiskey is Spanish oak, which means that it's going to have a little bit more intensity, um, some more, a bit more tannin as well. And... Uh, yeah, we're really, really happy with it, though, because what we've been able to create is something that is not just an overall sherry bomb. You can still distinctly taste that it is our whiskey. Uh, someone said it. Someone said once that, you know, a whiskey whiskeys from a certain distillery. It's talking in, about different topics in the same tone of voice, if that makes sense. Um, it makes total sense. And what I'll say about the cherry bomb comment is that um, it's really it's really not a sherry bomb. It's um, it it's it's something that is more accessible than that. And I, I say cherry bomb, I guess, with a little bit of uh, I don't want to say negativity, but like some of the typical sherry bombs are very one sided, and. Yeah. Uh, um, you really don't get a whole, let's say, the whole spectrum of flavors with certain certain uh, certain expressions, certain brands uh, that uh, that do that style of whiskey. Um, so this is far more accessible than that. Um, of course, the sherry bomb enthusiasts will love this, but so will uh, so will your your bourbon matured whiskey lover, of which I am definitely one. Um, and uh, uh, people who enjoy, uh, let's say, uh, blends uh, that, that, that contain those styles. So it's a really interesting whiskey because uh, you're not really uh, inundated with just a single note of dried, you know, dried raisins, dried uh, uh, dried plums, or um, uh, or figs or whatever. There's so much more going on here. Yeah, and that's that's what we wanted to. I mean, if you're talking about sherry casks with new distilleries, um, it's very very interesting as to what sherry looks like when you're talking to new distilleries. Um, obviously, Mark Renier has been very very vocal about the fact that good old fashioned sherry casks aren't available anymore, or not as readily available. Hence the reason why over at Waterford he's now using uh, VDNs, Van du Naturel casks. In which he thinks is a better expression of what is going on um, with that style of wine in European oak. What we found with our cooperage was down in Ureth was that they were using 
they weren't just seasoning the casks and then giving them to us with a little hint of sherry so that we could extract that and you know call it a sherry cask they were actually using sherry and using virgin oak and doing real aging for a, an extended period of time um so that you did get a true sense of what those casks were which meant that we could create something that was very very balanced of high quality and also you know we can be very honest about the fact that they are sherry casks. They're not just, it's not just seasoned American oak. And I think that shows in the flavor of the whiskey as well. You do get all of those notes of Oloroso, you know, the, the nuttiness. And then you're also going to get the Pedro Yemeneth with the dates and the raisins. But then you're also going to get the fruitiness of the Cotswold spirit in there as well. Definitely showcasing the spirit of Cotswold beautifully so. Um, and the tannin from the Spanish oak is really, really nice and subtle at the end as well. And for people that are sensitive, there really isn't a, uh, a sulfur component that turns some people off of, of sherry so yeah. this is i want to say it's um virtually sulfur free so you get you get immediate access to to dark chocolate um some um i can't think of the um the, the french patisserie style that i'm thinking of here but there's something that i've had in in france that's Kind of like a little little round shaped little uh, uh, pastry that is kind of like steamed almost, and it's yeah. uh, uh, it's it's like caramelly and vanilla, and uh, uh, you get the, the the really dark toasted end on the top. I can't think of the name of that that little thing. This is where, unfortunately, as a representative of the Cotswolds distillery, I let you down because Dan. Obviously, spending so much time living in France, he would have been straight there and able to tell you and probably yeah. has included it in various tasting notes. But I definitely do see where you're coming from with regards to that sweet caramelization of pastry patisserie style notes mm. that you're getting um, with those dark chocolate. Well, sort of mid milk chocolate sort of mm. brighter style flavor as well, almost like a, with a bit of acidity to it as well. Um, yeah, I think it's... Uh, it, it's a really good style of sherry whiskey that, like you say, bourbon drinkers can approach, sherry drinkers won't shy away from, and um, whiskey drinkers will appreciate as well. Definitely. And if, if anybody's trying to wrap their mind around what I was saying, it's got a ruffled edge, got a ruffled edge, and it's about yay, yay big and generally uh, round in, in nature. I can't think of the name of it, but it's delicious, and this is what I'm getting from this particular whiskey. I'll search that after the fact, and I'll leave it in a comment um, maybe tomorrow or tonight, as soon as I can find the name of that, uh, that particular uh, pastry. So just going back to the uh, the whiskey as well, um, I really need to reiterate that everything is first fill here as well. So the, whiskey, the, the, the sherry butts, the hogsheads, everything was first fill. There was no finishing. There was no sort of switching between liquids. Um, the marriage was all done in tank. We didn't sort of bring together and then finish off in barrel as well so that we could really we could really get that flavor point to exactly what we wanted from it as well. And then the ABV, just because of the, the, the differentiation of aging of cask, that's why we brought it down to about 57%, which meant that it, we gave a more rounded flavor as well. Hmm, someone telling me about my mic is cracking. I'm not sure why, but it, it might be because of my dog. Let me adjust that a little bit. I have a Yorkshire Terrier, and uh, he goes nuts. If, if he's not played with, he'll just start going crazy, uh, barking and whatnot, um, wanting someone to throw his ball or throw his teddy bear. So, funny guy. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about there, yeah. So with water here, uh, 
with water, this has really become uh, a supreme fruit bomb. And uh, I don't want to say it's a sharing bomb. Like I say, it's not that one-sided. It's much more complex than that. Uh, a beautiful sherry bomb. The cereal notes come out a little bit more when you add water as well. Mm -hmm. Just delicious. So uh, definitely deserves uh, a malt kiss for me. Beautiful stuff. I know that's a little bit weird. I've, I've been doing that. When I find that I love a whiskey, all I want to do is just hug the thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Not let it go. Okay. So we have one final whiskey to look at. And uh, as long as you're okay with time, we'll get into that one. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I've gone for a fresh glass as well because this is uh, this is a great little... Uh, this is a great little bottle, this one. An unsung hero, if you will. So this one is the uh, the peated cast. Well. Yep. And this mentions quarter cast. So, doesn't it? Quarter cast. Yep. Quarter cast. Qu well, quarter I cast. To, I have to assume that that's from Lafroy, even though you probably can't mention that uh, publicly. But that's the only whiskey that's really doing quarter cask enough volume that you would have the ability to buy those um, with regularity. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> simply, simply nod my head. But um, if one were to assume that the uh, quarter casks were from a distillery that would be closely resembled to the phrase Le Frog, <laughs> um yeah the the journey of the quarter casks from what i can gather from some of my friends that work at edrington beam centauri or edrington now um is that it starts the the barrels start their lives as uh makers mark barrels and then when transferred over to lafrog um they are coopered down from 225 down to 125 liters and then used for that pt pt um style spirit on Isla, and then once they've been used, distilleries such as ourselves are able to then buy those barrels. And the, the Cotswolds has no peat box. There's nothing of that nature um, in the uh, in the Cotswolds. So we're not going to try and do something peated when it's not readily accessible and sustainable for us. Um, but this is the next best thing when it comes to being able to impart peat and that flavor profile and create an expression of that nature with our portfolio and with our fruity spirit. So um, that's what we've done. We've just 100% full-term aged, uh, first fill. Wait, is it first fill? Probably not, it's probably third fill, maybe even fourth, we don't know. But we've used these quarter casks to impart a peaty style flavor onto our fruity spirit. And as you've mentioned a couple of times throughout the tasting, when you're talking about campfire vanilla, you know, our distillers, as Dan has said in previous, uh, in previous interviews is this is marshmallows and vanilla ice cream by a campfire. Now, when I'm nosing this, don't assume that this is a, a, a heavily peat whiskey. It's really more like um, a whiskey with subtle peat influences. And it would be something kind of like the level of peating with, let's say, Spring Bank. Um, yeah. Or, uh, it's almost like uh, there's a salinity to it. Like it's it's it smells. If you were to smell it in a blind tasting, you'd almost smell it as um, as a coastal style whiskey, uh, because the peat isn't really really prevalent on the nose. Um, but I've I've tasted this with various people around Europe, and one thing that we've always agreed on is that the the flavour versus the actual um, the nose don't quite connect because the palate is completely different to what the nose is but not in a negative way it's not disjointed it's just a different style of journey and there's a couple of bourbons that have this type of a, a smoky note to it um so it's uh it's let's say it's smoky rather than peaty in a sense or if you're talking about peat and it's uh it's of the lighter style of peat um and yeah not overbearing and anybody who has a peat sensitivity will probably be able to approach this and say, okay i get the smoke and i enjoy it 
and it's it's not uh, it's not overpowering. So, so don't think of this as um, in your face peep that prevents you from from enjoying a particular whiskey. This is definitely something that I think every single whiskey lover, whether you like peat or whether you don't, can approach this and say, "Oh yeah, this is really interesting. It's smoky and sweet and delicious." Yeah, it's um, yeah. it's it's re it's reminiscent of some Brooklades. Cheers to you, sir. Cheers. In which you know that it's been influenced and been in the company of peat, but the actual barley and the and the new make isn't peated, and it's that wonderful marriage in which it's it's sweet, it's buttery, it's creamy, it's but it's also got spicier notes. It's got creamy sort of like smoldering campfire smoky notes as well but there's a little bit of salinity in there and the length of this whiskey it, it just goes on for ages you know when you taste it you sort of need to take a few seconds to enjoy the journey of what's going on on your palate as well and one thing i will say with this whiskey is um whilst we never ever tell people how to drink their whiskey if you enjoy all of these elements of the whiskey when you add water because it is a tertiary flavor profile that's come from the barrel um, you tend to lose it as soon as you add water. So I, I always say, you know, proceed with caution when you're trying to bring that ABV from 60 down. Maybe don't. That's sound advice. Um, the flavor is definitely smoke tinged. Um, absolutely, we get the, uh, uh, the campfire marshmallows here. And... Um, Beautiful sweet note. We have uh, again just uh, big, big vanilla, some burnt caramel or uh, creme brulee coming through as well. Yeah, which is beautiful. Mm. Well, I will add just a bit of water just, just because I have uh, that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've got enough to dispose of there where you can test my theory. Definitely. Yeah, but what milliliter added to uh, to what? So. Really, really rich. You know, it, it's almost as if you took a, a, a some kind of a, a boiled dessert, like a, like a pudding or whatever. And you cook that. There's, there's my youngest daughter crying about something. Apologies. Anyway. Uh, oh. Can you hear that? It doesn't, it, it doesn't come through too bad. I think you're okay. I think you're okay. I think if, if we keep talking about delicious whiskey, everything's going to be okay. Uh, yeah, she has the loudest voice. Anyway, so you got this, this uh, uh, some kind of a boiled dessert, like, like pudding or whatnot. But you're actually cooking that on a campfire in the woods with uh, with hardwood or just whatever, you know. So you get this really smoked effect on uh, on the whiskey, on the the pudding, pardon me, and uh, really really interesting that way. And again, the flavor profile matched against the ABV at sixty percent, but the creamy texture as well. It's such a delicious style of whiskey. I, we really love this one. It's, like I say, it's quite the unsung hero in our portfolio because it was just something that we thought we'd give a go and then we gave it a taste and all of a sudden we were like, wow, that is fantastic. That is really good. And we started taking samples out and about to show people at various shows and everyone said, you know, it was one of those things you grab from under the counter if you found someone was engaged with the brand. You gave them a taste and went, I'm sorry, but what is that? And, uh, you know, that's where it came to its uh, its fruition was just from people really reacting positively to it. Well, hmm. um, I'll just read this. Made from grain to glass, the Cotswolds, and matured in ex-peated quarter casks to create a rich, fruity single malt whiskey with a subtle smoke. Um, Let's go one further than subtle. Yeah. I think I think few people will know that until uh, let's say until about two thousand and five, the Morangi was actually uh, lightly peated. 
and would definitely be in the category of being subtly cheated. So yeah. here is, uh, uh, let's say, one step above um, that kind of very low level of peak and uh, um, smoky and peaty to, uh, to a level that uh, really complements with the style of whiskey. And we get, um, um, as I said, like it's like that, that, that pudding, that boiled pudding on a campfire where you're getting uh, all these kinds of vanillas mixed with smoke and um, uh, some delicate salinity, as you mentioned, and it's really, really beautiful, and I really love that. So cheers to you, Rob. Yeah, um, cheers to you, Mark. What a great one to finish on. Oh, yes. Hmm. Well, it goes without saying this deserves a little malt kiss and a little... Hmm. Beautiful. Now, if I was to choose between the three, I would really have a hard time because uh, these are all just fantastic. Um, you know, it's 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 like trying to pick your favorite child, right? Yeah, it's it, yeah, favorite child or, or favorite song. You know, sometimes in a certain mood, a certain bottle or song will. I don't have children, sorry. Um, will always be more applicable to that mood you're in so to speak um so yeah i guess it's it's a tough one for me i i must admit the flagship does do a lot for me simply because it's so easy it's sort of that it's sort of that uh monday to thursday whiskey whereas uh founder's choice is that saturday night disco whiskey maybe uh Heated cask on a Friday when you're sort of trying to contemplate the week and then maybe a sherry just to finish off a great weekend. For sure. Or, you know, like on, on a cold, rainy day, the peated cask is definitely what I would reach for. Absolutely. Yeah. We're all, all amazing. I think... I must admit, we always say that... Probably, probably my favorite is the founders. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and these two are almost like tied for second, but it's like, it's like, just like a hair, uh, a hair's width away from the, uh, uh, hair's breadth away from the, the founder's reserve, founder's choice, pardon me. Fantastic. Amazing. I was just about to say, we always describe ourselves as, well, I do anyway, with a dinner party distillery because... You can turn up and you can have some nice spritzes as an aperitif and maybe some martinis with your starter and then maybe some whiskeys over some steaks and then you can have some cream liqueurs with your desserts and then we've got all sorts of things that you can add as a digestif as well. So, you know, if you're ever hosting people, our distillery is the one to go for because we've got all occasions covered. You really could do a, um, um, you know, pre-game to post-game and everything in between with, with Paul Gold, which is really amazing. Uh, pretty fantastic. Now, I wonder, before we wrap things up here, uh, let's see if we have any questions from, uh, from anybody that's watching along, or whether you're on Facebook and watching on Facebook Live or on uh, YouTube on a live stream. If you have a question for Rob about the distillery, about himself, or about any of these whiskeys, please pose them now, and, uh, and I'll highlight them. And we'll talk about that uh, at length before we wrap things up here. And uh, a lot of positive comments here, of course. Uh, Graham Young, who uh, is a uh, supporter of my channel and a whole host of others. And I think he's planning to come and visit your distillery. Uh, he, might, he might be visiting uh, uh, Scotland and England in uh, 20, 2021, October so October sometime he'll be ending up over there. So that'd be great. Cool to, could show up. So pretty amazing. And uh, yeah, do let us know ahead of time. Who who is this individual? Did you mention that might be your? Oh, the, uh, that's my brother. And, your brother. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's on holiday in the north of England at the moment, and he's tuned in on YouTube live. And uh, when he speaks of Smokey and the Bandit, that's the name of my two dogs. <laughs> uh, you know, perfect name is for dogs. That's amazing. Well, it's the greatest. It's the greatest film of all time. So uh, I thought I'd 
perpetuate that with the naming of my dogs. Was that, was that Steve McQueen in that in that film? Oh, it was uh, Burt Reynolds and Jackie Gleason. Burt Reynolds. Yes. And yeah. Sally Field, of course. A classic Hal Needham film. Sally Fields, you know, uh, all of them amazing act actors and actresses. Uh, she's always been uh, very prolific throughout all the ages, right? She's the she was the uh, uh, the beauty queen, and then she became everybody's uh, like the, the mother of all films. So pretty interesting. Um, a comment from uh, from Peter Burns at Craft Sellers. Yes. Uh, oh, the sherry. Yes. Uh, spirited sherry is what Peter's referring to. So uh, I, I think I alluded to uh, the fact that we take all of our barrels in their entirety. Uh, we don't buy staves and then have anyone put them back together. So uh, we do get wet barrels, especially from the bodegas down in Ureth. And we were finding we were getting lit Well, we were buying liters of sherry. And so what we decided to do was mix together some Pedri Yemeneth, some Oloroso with some Cotswolds New Make Spirit and put them through an STR for a few months. And so instead of a spirit influenced by um, sherry, we wanted a sherry influenced by spirit. And so it's an inverted style uh, sherry and it's, it's, it's so special. It's so great. I think we, we may have discontinued it now as well. So RIP spirited sherry. So that was actually a, a uh, an S, uh, like a, a skew that she sold in, in England. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, if, if you ever come to our distillery, and I really hope you do, um, we have close to about 35 to 40 different lines. So we have a little uh, new product development lab, an R&D lab. And as well as what we've tasted through today, we've made limoncello, amaro, rum, um summer cup which is akin to pims we've made cream liqueurs we've made triple sec we've made apple brandy which we didn't name calvados we named it cotswolvados which is very different um yeah we, we we've tried out all sorts of things i think the only thing that we haven't really looked at is agave spirits for obvious reasons but other than that vermouth using cotswolds grapes we've made that as well yeah um we're never bored at the cotswolds distillery that's really amazing. And, and one thing I have to say, though, is that um, uh, I actually, you know, as I said, I've experimented with uh, with certain copper uh, e equipment. And uh, I have to say that kind of uh, elusively because it's really not um, it's, it's it's not not really legal in Canada. But uh, <laughs> um, one thing that's interesting is I took some. Um, uh, I took some, um, what's the word? The uh, the spirit from uh, from Hungary, some Tokai. I took some oh, Tokai, yes. uh, the whiskey, the, the pardon me, the wine from Tokai. I took, took some Tokai, and um, and and I, I matured the Tokai in a, a a little cask that held whiskey, and it was yeah. interesting because the ABV jumped up about three or four percent from the uh, the remaining spirit that was in the staves and it basically turned the tokai into kind of like a uh an almost um um four well, it's fortified yeah wine. it's fortified you'd call it a van yeah. natural yeah so uh, and it was it was it's fabulous and it's it remains the it keeps the uh uh the the natural aspects of tokai but just gives it a little bit of extra oomph from uh, from the uh, from the uh, the cask that held that held some whiskey that I was experimenting with, but uh, really interesting. So that's totally amazing that you're experimenting with so many things. And I think uh, you know, to my knowledge, we just get the gin and the whiskey. So I don't know. Uh, I think anybody that's traveling to to the UK, obviously, you must have these types of of experiments that are that are for sale every now and again. Yeah. So is yeah, there anything yeah. coming up uh, in the in the near future that people should look out for? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of, uh, we've just released a brand new summer cup, a uh, brand new recipe that we're really excited about. It's a combination of our dry gin with sherry. Um, and it's, it's brilliant. We've got two more whiskey releases coming up this year that um, will be information wise released in due course. 
Um, we've just released hint? our... No hints? No hints? Um, <laughs> bit of bourbon, maybe. Mm. And, uh, and another one that's quite exciting. Um, we've just released our second Hearts and Crafts um, release. And Hearts and Crafts, uh, William Morris really started the... Um, the hearts and crafts movement in the uk and he did that from the cotswolds and hearts and crafts you know that's really ties into whiskey and what we do and our first release last year was sautern cask 100 percent on european oak and this year we released a pina de chiron cask which was it was delicious it was really really great Looking at your website, uh, I guess uh, in the last couple of days, I noticed that Sauternes cask, uh, I think it was about 75 pounds. And uh, my first thought was, first of all, I love I love Sauternes matured whiskeys. Mostly you find Sauternes uh, finished. So is that a finished or is that much fully matured in Sauternes? Full matured. Fully matured. Incredible. Yeah. We, Incredible. Everything, everything we do is full time. Uh, we fantastic. don't do any finishing. Yeah, um, we just find it it's important. And, you know, English whiskey as a category is still an acorn. And so we want to be able to make sure that we uphold the quality of making good whiskey and not cutting any corners to make sure that English whiskey is a category. We're, we're not the only ones. We're one of maybe 20, 25, maybe even more distilleries in England. But quality is key to make sure that you're allowing a category to really blossom. Incredible. Um, well, I guess we should start wrapping this up. But uh, first of all, a big thank you to uh, to Rob uh, Rob Patchett from Cotswolds Distillery for being patient Patrick. with uh, the lateness of this particular live stream. And um, the next time we do this, I, I will make sure that uh, that I've got everything all set up and working well in advance so that we have no issues whatsoever. Uh, I apologize. I just moved actually about... Uh, a week and a half ago, so um, it's uh, an, an unexpected issue that arose, and I, I don't know what to do. Uh, but regardless, thank you so much for having us, and a big thanks to uh, to the the uh, to the Winters, uh, Greg and Yarka Winters for Greg and Yarka. Uh, thank you so us, much. Yeah, yeah, providing me with uh, some amazing spirits and uh, opening a new door for me. Um, Actually, this is actually my second time trying Cotswolds. I had a, a little bit of Cotswolds in a, a lineup of other mini mini bottles that I tried. And uh, I think Cotswolds was third behind Millstone and Glenallachy. Um, so you're in good company. We'll take that. that. We'll absolutely, take that. That's absolutely. great. <laughs> That's so, great. Uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching. And what we tried today was the dry gin which was uh, a very impressive gin, very sippable and also very uh, uh, very creatable. You can make a lot of amazing uh, concoctions with this particular dry gin. Uh, Outstanding martini. Oh yes, I I'm you know all already. I'm planning on uh, getting some some nice olives and some uh, uh, some good local vermouth, and then we have this this stunner. This is a stunning gin. Uh, that's the Cotswold Wildflower Gin Number One. Uh, delicious. You can sip it straight from the bottle. Um, you can craft your own cocktails with that. It's beautiful with a little bit of uh, uh, club soda, as I uh, showcase, which uh, uh, is still going to be uh, fueling me today for my uh, my lawn mowing. I'm going to be lawn mowing the lawn today and sipping on this one. Good motivation. Mm. And then we tried a, uh, 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 not a triplet, but a quadruplet of whiskeys. The, um, uh, the standard, the uh, ubiquitous, uh, the flagship Cotswold single malt. And then we tried the, um, uh, the founder's choice, which is very, very impressive. And I think, um, I think everybody that's watching, if there's one particular Cotswolds whiskey that you want to try, that might be the starting point if you are a, a whiskey enthusiast, if you are a whiskey YouTuber or uh, uh, an influencer. Um, if you are um, just wanting to try something new, you might want to try the flagship Cotswolds whiskey. And then we have the uh, impressive and very fruity, uh, the, uh, uh, the sherry cask. Also, uh, cask strength and beautiful. 
And finally, the peated cask, which is done in quarter casks, probably from Lefroy, though Rob will neither agree nor deny to that effect. Uh, but uh, a very beautiful uh, single malt with uh, some definite smoke and a little bit of peat and just a delicious, delicious concoction, uh, uh, the whiskey. Uh, but beautiful stuff. But anyway, uh, first of all, thanks to everybody that's watching, both uh, now uh, you're watching live or you're watching in the future. I really appreciate that. And a uh, huge thanks to, to Rob himself. Um, so uh, I really appreciate that, Rob. But, uh, you know, again, I'm a little bit nervous here. Hope you had a good time with, uh, with me today. Cheers to you. Cheers to you, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Brilliant host. And in the face of adversity, you've done phenomenally well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, we'll look for a flawless stream the next time. Let's say, uh, uh, you know, within the next six months or year. I'd love to see you again. And I have a feeling that... Uh, that there might be some some big changes for you in your uh, your your job job profile with Cotswolds Distillery because you are very very um, what can I say um, influential and uh, not not to mention not to mention dashing with that beautiful luxurious beard but uh, I, th I think that um, maybe there could be some some uh, some interesting uh, progression for you in the, in the uh, pardon me in the distillery. In the future so hopefully that is uh, the case but uh, i'm losing my words here uh what i mean to say is that you've been just awesome today and i really appreciate that a pleasure hopefully they'll have me not mopping the floor soon <laughs> i think not i think not <laughs> and uh if you come to canada uh, i'd love to see you in winnipeg uh with my winnipeg whiskey club uh, 100%. We'll, uh have you for a, a full-on cotswolds whiskey event in winnipeg so uh, we'll make that that plan sometime soon, I do hope. Okay, so take Absolutely. care. Thank and you I very really much. Appreciate it. And again, I apologize. I'm gushing here. Uh, it's really fun to uh, to chat uh, with uh, with uh, experienced professionals such as yourself. So uh, take care, everybody, for watching. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you for the next uh, the next time. I'm I'm wrecking this, but uh, I'm just having so much fun here. All right. So take care, everybody. Thank Bye -bye you, everyone. Now.